Thank you for the invitation. Today we are going to talk about science, pseudoscience, and fake publications. The use of the word of science is very different for many people. We will talk about, I will explain where the certain things come from and what's the origin and why should we care and what can we do. Recent publication titles contain a lot of questions about science. How science goes wrong, false news online, science of fake news, pseudo journals, predatory journals, and so on. We are all aware of that the flood of unverified information on the internet. Of course, the internet is not regulated and there is no quality control, and we know that everything which is published on the internet is true. Sensationalism in newspapers, magazines, and journals. One of my colleagues talk about this like the research fashion show, that which demonstrates a lot of unique and beautiful things, except you would never wear it on the street. Look at this scary title, dihydrogen monoxide is an acid with a pH level of 7. This is higher than any acid, which is true because it's water. But the untrained mind, this is a scary message. Even bigger problem that many published studies cannot be replicated, and replication studies are not a normal and essential part of science. Everybody publishes their results and not the negative ones, probably because they are afraid of looking incompetent. Science has many definitions. For example, the intellectual practical activity and capacity systemic study structure, behavior, and so on. And the systematic enterprise. So the systematic is always there. What I like, it is a systematically organized body of knowledge on a particular subject, what we know today. It is always based on validated information. It's driven by logic. Its established elements have a long half-life. For any paradigm change, new technology, or a new medical problem, every decision has its political, health-related, and economic consequence. All scientific methods try to exclude subjectivity as opposed to politics, which is subjective and can change any time if the parties change, and business, which is driven by profit, for all of them influenced by human behavior. Science, business, and politics cannot exist without each other, but they are always in conflict because of their different nature. Pseudoscience is a substitute for those who would love to understand, but they didn't have a chance, but they like the understanding to separate facts from fiction. And let's typically come up with a very simple explanation. In pseudoscience, everything has a simple explanation, usually based on hearsay, these are the Opinions, oh, that everybody knows that this and everybody knows that that. Believe to be whole truth. Fake science considerably differs from pseudoscience by this intention, because the fake science is a consequence of fake publications and is designed for desperate authors and primarily designed to make money for predatory publishers. Fake publications often based on fictional or stolen data and they harm the public trust. These are the publications for the sake of having a publication. Publications are not science. Science is dynamic and contains concepts, information, and validated and accepted ideas. In the literature, there are also other elements that either have not yet been accepted because they're too novel, too original, it's not a quite quality, they cannot be reproduced, and the reasoning is not debated, it's, it happens often that we agree to the facts, but disagree in the explanations. We always bombard the information of the outside world. As the, most of them are accidental, overheard, hearsay. For example, how did you come to the place you are listening now today? Have you seen other people? Who do you remember? Have you met someone you know? Did you see an accident? Certain things. You remember and certain things you don't. Our mind acquires, evaluates, connects and disconnects information to form memories. And it does it by looking for patterns and understand principles to take actions. So we need to observe that just here's something. But be careful. 
because the human brain is powerful. Believe it or not, these are parallel lines. The squares are a little bit shifted relatively to each other. It's interpreted as, as not straight lines. What we see is always the result of our interpretation. So seeing is not enough. We need to observe with intent and measure. And then we need to understand relations and which creates a piece of information. Once we have many pieces of information, definitely more than one, then we start understanding patterns, which leads us to knowledge. But, but what if we have many pieces of knowledge? We have to consolidate, understand the principle, it takes us to a certain level of wisdom, so we can take intelligent action. Most of the time, we do not take intelligent actions. We are creatures of habit, and we don't think all the time that now I have to step forward with my left leg or my right leg, and that this is the way home, and so on. Knowledge is often passive. It sits in brains, computer memories, libraries, and we need to understand the principles to take intelligent actions, which allows us to simplify complexity. Could it be more simple? How much time, how much effort needed to get to this formula? Simplifying complexity makes quantitative predictions possible. And wisdom also makes possible quantitative predictions. The essence is usually simple, only the details are complicated. Publications are not science. Publications are yesterday's shared information and knowledge, organized and stored on various media. Wise, being wise, and wisdom, it's a human thing. The role of an article is providing new information based on measured data that contributes to knowledge. Ideally, every piece of new knowledge is built upon existing knowledge and reproducible new information. This is the role of reviews, to reconcile pieces of knowledge and clarify principles. The role of a scientific publication to improve our knowledge. The original purpose of scientific publications was to share data. Uh, scientists, even early times in the 1500s, 1600s, they came together and they discussed and uh, peer reviewed. And the writers and the readers were the same people, and information was for scientists. Today, writers and readers often are the same. Postdocs and grad students read way more articles than professors do. That leads to sub-quality, and also there's a problem with commercial publishing. So we are informing now almost every people. Today, there are many reasons for publishing a paper and primarily for existential reasons, and to share scientific information and knowledge. I have to say that it also depends on the level of the scientist. With the beginners, the existential reasons are way more important, and the, when the tenured and the fixed position the shares information and knowledge. Scientists could play the role of authors, reviewers, editors, and readers. And they are all evaluated by the publication output at its so-called impact. Therefore, they must prove their value every day, publishing original and significant results. In high-impact media, the question is, what high-impact, high-value, original, and significant means? Scholarly publishing reflects life and today's infodemic. Customization is everywhere. Commercial algorithms watching to learn your preferences, to reinforce your beliefs and habits. Social media is not about information, it's about affirmation. Data manipulation is rampant. Digital data search allows the injection of alternative facts based on fabricated data that create fake information, which becomes knowledge, knowledge, and leads to bubbles that people live in. The revenue of model of social media is not truth, it's popularity, and hype attracts clicks. And so there is also information manipulation, emphasizing different parts of the same complete information, usually, again, for uh, political or business purposes. 
classic example is the blind man and the elephant. They all touch a different part of the elephant, and everybody believes in their own version. The history of publishing has always been determined by the available technology. In the old days, and I'm showing the Edwin Smith papyrus, which is the first medical test from 3000 BC, which is not based on magic. At that time, the communication was hard, and there was certainly everybody was trying to tell and share only true information. There's no reason to inject and no way to inject false information, fake publications. Now, printing revolution changed a lot. Information and knowledge now was printed on paper and knowledge stored in libraries. The new gen technology generated a new business opportunity because it was one of the most more effective way, much more effective, much more efficient way of communication than writing and sending letters. But to do that required large scale printing. It required the use of specific heavy machinery. So professional and large business organizations formed. To prevent mass copying books, copyright law was soon introduced because you cannot sell somebody else's property. This is where the today's requirement of originality and novelty were also born. Printing played a key role in development of the Renaissance, the age of enlightenment and the scientific revolution, and it spread the knowledge to the masses. The philosophical transactions of the Royal Societies was the first scientific paper. Here is the volume one front page from 1665. It's Editor and publishing with Heinrich Oldenburg, and he created the scientific peer review. But at that time, science publishing was not a good business. The computer revolution led to an explosion in printed publications. The new technology changed the ways, increased mobility, transfer rate, and also increased paper consumption waste, which placed put economic burden on libraries. In 2021, a scientific paper was published every 5.5 minutes. That's about 3 million science and engineering papers. If you put it on the top of each other, it's almost at the height of the Chomoluma in the, in the Himalayas. For the first time in human history, we now generate information faster than if we can evaluate by traditional methods, that is, peer, by peer review. That uh, resulted in the crisis of peer review and the weakening of quality control. In the past 10 years, the number of scientists reached 10 million in 2022, and the number of articles is rising, still rising 8 to 9 percent a year. It was 2013, there was about four, now it's about six, the average number. Meanwhile, the number of articles with unique author is unchanged about 0.6. Talking about peer review, these papers had required at least six to nine million quality critiques, at least eight to two or three critiques. But the reviewer response rate is around 3%, and the most active ones are not the most qualified. So if it's just everybody reviews one paper, we would still need three times of scientists that we have now, not to mention a different field, different expertise in different fields. This person wrote 17 papers and wrote 142 reviews. Is it possible that he is so talented and so knowledgeable? The present system motivates authors to publish more and not better papers, which is known in salami slicing in the publications. One way is to generate a lot of readers and a lot of citations is hype. This paper published in Plus Medicine has a very hype title, acquired more than 2,600,000 hundred thousand readers and almost six thousand citations. Ironically, the paper itself is false. It's based on false criteria. The commercialization of scholarly publishing, the promotion of graduation rules, electronic information only, and greed fueled by the ease of online publishing. Commercial publishing is a great money making opportunity. If you consider a commonly accepted $4,000 price tag for a paper, it's only 600 goes to the, to the publication. 
cost. The profit margins about 30% and most of it it goes to salaries and uh, building grants. As a matter of fact, more money is spent on marketing than publishing. Let's talk about the landscape. So it's a good business. And there are about 10,000 journal publishers globally. A half of them is in Scopus. About 650 publishers uh, produce about 50% of the total journal output. And five companies are ruling the, the field. There is about 33,000 peer-reviewed English journals in the 2018s. And uh, still the, the number of researchers is rising and they forced to publish more and more. So how good this business is? The BMW's return on investment around 10%. Five companies earned approximately 31 billion, and the operating profits of Reed Elsevier as a whole was somewhere between 15 and 25%, depending on the year. And but the medical divisions were around 40%, 30 and 40%. Only Pfizer does better than Elsevier and Springer. The second thing is the promotion and graduation rules set before the computer age. There was a serious reason for creating journal impact factor. It was created to evaluate which journals libraries should buy because they could not buy everything. So they looked for journals that had the most citations and the most recent citations and they bought those things. The journal impact factor is for journals and not to be misrepresented an impact factor of an article or even impact that should not be used to judge individual authors. If we added up everybody's publication in the audience and then calculated an average number, what would that number say about any of us? However, it would say something about the meeting. Impacts, yes, publications do have impacts. They have impact on science, the quality of the knowledge and its reliability, methods, discoveries, reproducibility, so on. So they have serious impact on publishers, on the published journal's profit, the market share, business models, and definitely have impact on scientists. The evaluation method is based on citations, so sometimes they can't even graduate unless they publish a certain number of papers in certain higher than three impact factor journals. It doesn't it matter for tenure, promotion, credibility, respect, whether you can get a grant, expense to their departments and their institutions. So what does a, a publication and high journal impact factor give you? It fulfills a serious existential need. It also might give you a better chance that your article will be read and cited. Generally, people believe that high impact factor journals have more readers and the most, most read are the most cited. This is false. None of those are true. If you look at the top 100 publications, many of them were published in different small journals. Only four nature and three science publication was in the first 100 publication. You can look it up, actually. You can search for it. In uh, It was a Nature article a few couple of years ago. And there's an interesting uh, article also saying that uh, many of Nobel laureates today do not and could not qualify for a professorship in the UK. Look at, for example, number three. It was an article, Biochem 76, impact factor is 2.3. It only acquired uh, 150,000 citations. I would love that. So publication in a higher impact factor journal only proves that your article passed the review process of the journal, which is not a small achievement because it's not, not easy. But its impact on science remains unknown for a number of years, usually more than five years. So what does the rejectance say? The fellow in there, Sir Peter John Radcliffe, the Nobel laureate from 2019, and the letter on the right from Nature is the rejection letter for the work that just won the Nobel Prize. So don't be disappointed if something is rejected. Make it better. Maybe it just was a wrong communication. This is number three. 
All information is now electronic and remains accessible. Journals require only computers and publishing software. And since 2014, so it's almost 10 years now, information is stored in digital format. The issue with the digital format is that science corrects itself, but publications do not. Only about 0.2% of articles were retracted between 75 and 2010, as opposed to the estimated 5% that should have been. And over 320 disgraced COVID-19 studies are still routinely cited. If you look at the top most cited retracted papers, several of them got way more citations after they was retracted, like number three or number two. And of course, the major issue is money. We know about predatory open access journals and there's uh, several examples them. You can uh, check out all these at going to www.callingbullshit.org, which is a great name, by the way. We recommend to take a look at it. And it's again, remember there were 33,000 and it's around one and uh, since we estimate like 2,000 now. So it's a small amount, but the tendency is what? And there are also hijack journals. A couple of examples. Authentic journal is on the right, the hijack is on the left. So for example, Albertina and the journal of Albertina and so on. You can look at, again, the Scientometrics. Take the time and search before they publish. These cloned journals may register an expired domain, hack the site, download things. Several of them got into international databases. They provide a fake impact factor, Copernicus, and so on, because it's very hard to get in, in indexing with these journals target those researchers who require robust publishing journals indexing international one, or those include a whitelist which is applied in India. It's a good idea to look at the archive of any journal, which if you're suspicious, because there is no way they can copy the whole archive. The newest menaces about shameless scams, we are all familiar with it, emails, leadings, fake websites, I'll show you an interesting one. You may not know, but peer review companies offer positive peer reviews in exchange for money. Journal form, they also die, and the credibility of the article published in dead journals it diminishes seriously. Website, fake website, paper mail, the pre, pre problem, and AI. Next. This is California South University, claiming a public research university with 150 buildings covering 50 city blocks, Irvine, California. The problem is that it is not on Google Maps. It doesn't exist. It's a fiction. So again, don't believe everything what you see on the internet. Paper mills. This is one of the troubling recent developments. They manufacture manuscripts and submit them on behalf of researchers for money. So you can buy a first authorship, you can buy a last authorship, if you want to risk that it will be identified and you are done for life. It is estimated like more than 20,000 uh, fake publications. Again, this is a small percentage compared to the 3 million, but the tendency is bad. In 2021, from January to December, journal have retracted at least 370 papers linked to paper mills, according to Nature. The Russian company claims to have added the names there more than 10,000 researchers over the past three years. The price is starting about $500. And just a recent development, in two, three days ago, Wiley had 19 journals kicked out from Clarivate, and they now shut down four journals which were overrun by paper mills and halted all special issues. Now the next one is the preprint problem. Preprints were heavily advertised that it's a great way to stake out your area and prove that you are first. The problem is that they are unchecked for quality. 
and newspapers use it as a source, as a new knowledge, as a new science. Very few comments are posted and after submitted to a journal for peer review, there is no link to the final record. So you still might look at the original uncorrected versions. There is no standard way to retract preprints. For example, there is no credible evidence that the COVID-19 pandemic has a bioengineered origin. But there was an article in BioArchive that acquired a huge number of citations. Despite of the fact that it is immediately withdrawn, but it's already got out on the, on the net. And there was a two-page note, not even a research paper, claiming that SARS-CoV is an escape bioweapon and immediately took off, even though it's within a day it was deleted from the site, this document took off and within conspiracy circles and still going around. And of course, the, and the newest one, the AI models, generative AI tools, which are large language one as, again, sensational refer to the AI does this, AI does that. AI now, it's a very <laughs> confusing name. We've seen too many movies with Arnold Schwarzenegger and and other actors that turn out to be mechanized people. These are tools that may be used for good and bad purposes. They absorb and contain immense amount of existing tests. They are very intelligent, but they are not creative. They are excellent in extracting existing text, existing content, and formulating it grammatically correct and human-like summaries. But we don't know how do they do it? We don't know what the, what those texts that they were trained and companies do not disclose these data. So we researchers, we need to collaborate to develop an open source large language, large language models trained on superior scientific articles. Really the generative AI is a black box. The correct workflow is a lot depends on the prompt engineering. So the input, what you put in, and the quality control, whatever comes out, the usually different versions, how do you check that quality? In short, they're good at uncovering and bad at discovering. They do not, they cannot know new info, do not create new information. They still can shake up the scholar evaluation system because it's based on citations. They don't provide citations. Where did they get those distilled information? Anyway, they are here and we better learn how to deal with them, how to use them wisely and uh, how to avoid them, how to train them, how to handle them and how to restrain them. Finally, let me talk to you about uh, our journal Precision Nanomedicine, which you can find at pnano.com. This is a Scopus indexed, scientist owned, open access and peer reviewed and free journal. It's an international society journal and they promote all aspects of medicine, including nanomedicine. We accept replication studies. We allow sharing negative results because we think it's very important the need to know what not to do. We don't need APCs, reduce long waiting times of one to four weeks. And we also take a paper to the readers using social media assist authors instead of criticizing them. We have 45 members of the editorial board who are the top 2% scientists in the world. That's how I see your manuscript. I, so do not copy sentences, paragraphs without referring them and always acknowledge citation sources. I can tell you how many percentage of that text came from different sources. We also use automated image proofing all submissions are checked for flipping, rotating, connecting, copying. Here's an example, image proofing. The left side is much submitted, there's two images of what you see. The right side, it's hard to see, but it's con they connected by blue line. And it's not, it, the comparison says that it's not flipped. It scaled the right one to 99%. So this probably was a copy paste. Second submit was not rotated. And, but they match in 160 features. Finally, an advice, follow Retraction Watch at retractionwatch.com and follow the scientists 
both of them are free for the users and they keep you very much up to date what to look out for. Summary. Scientific knowledge is becoming more and more interdisciplinary and complex, and the volume of publishing is getting more messy. Papers published by academia, libraries, and societies constantly rising as compared to uh, commercial publishers, but it's still they are the dominant ones. Thick science, as I mentioned several times, publications are relatively rare, but the tendency is alarming. I don't want to sound too pessimistic, talking about too much, but this talk was not about our achievements, but our problems. Science is going through a development, especially accelerated recently, and don't worry, science will be fine. Thank you for your attention.